Let us pray. Gracious God, bless these oh-so-human words that I speak and the human hearts and minds that listen, that this might be a time where your spirit breaks through and we hear you calling for us. Bring comfort to those who need it. Stir from complacency those who need it. This is your time. May it be so. It is only a matter of time before the seeds produce fruit. Jack's parents are waiting for him to crawl. It's only a matter of time when all the nurturing that they have poured in produces a child who can name all the fruits, tie his own shoes, and learn what it means to be human in a world shaped by this great uprising of love. Now, some would like you to believe that this is a fearful time, a time of mask wearing and social unrest. And they are right to name fear as a force to reckon with. But this is also a time where the seeds are lavishly being scattered in love and are producing an abundance of prophetic voices to show us the way to the future beyond that fear sitting in a boat by the shores of Galilee. Jesus speaks of the sower that throws out the seeds on rocky, hard, thorny soils, soils that have little hope of taking root, reckless, wasteful, perhaps. But this sower, this sower doesn't want anyone to miss the miracle for a sevenfold yield would be a good harvest for the farmers in Jesus' audience. A thirtyfold feed field would feed the entire village for a year. On a hundredfold harvest, a farmer could retire to the villa by the sea. And while a private villa sounds nice, the parable points not to the human dreams that we have, but to God's dream of a world where a farmer's abundance is shared with all, every mouth fed, every life valued, all of creation in balance. This is what Jesus offers to the faithful listener who turns to the task of creating hospitable soil for God's love to root in. This is the task that you and I sign up for when we profess our faith in Christ and we commit to following. This is the job of the parents who ask for baptism, the godparents and the church community who agree to support the baptismal family. Darnell M. Moore, a modern-day prophetic voice rising up from the streets of Camden, New Jersey, speaks to us of the invisible forces moving about like ghosted hands, a hand that would touch my cheek and steer my eyes away from the mirror. These are the forces that call us away from the work that is ours to do. They invite us instead to point a finger to where we think that the monster or the boogeyman or the tyrant lives because self-reflexivity, self-reflection, honest reckoning is something that most of us do not like. And as a gay black man, Darnell is familiar with the oppressive shackles of heterosexual and white cultural normality, but there are also shackles in patriarchy, something that he has benefited from as a man. And through his writing, Darnell invites each one of us to look into the heart and notice where the edges of our own love exists. While helping to build the Black Lives Movement in the US, he was told that including black trans lives was a distraction from the work of black liberation. And when he went to Pride with his friends, he saw how his queer friends grew angry when the Black Lives protesters disrupted the march. Darnell says that the edges of love 
are very limited to the ways that our politics are organized around our self-interest and our desires, the things that touch us at our own home. So we stop there. But when he speaks of love, when he speaks of love, he speaks of costly love, not cheap, hallmarkish love, the way that we've come to imagine love, the kind of love that Jesus spoke of, this costly love, the kind that transforms you, the kind that wakes you up every four hours to feed the baby, the love that stretches preconceived notions of survival of the fittest and understands that our liberation is bound up in the plight of our neighbors who do not look or act like us, but are one with us. Reflecting on today's parable of the sower, the theologians at Enfleshed ask us, when love stretches our understanding, are we able to practice the humility necessary to admit that our own experiences are not enough information to lean on? Or do we come to the edges of our love and give up on the idea of truth that is new to us, letting the evil one come and snatch it away? When we come to the edge of our love, the place where our edge and eager good intentions are incited by the urgency of the moment have to fade into a calling of a long, slow work of learning and unlearning, organizing and building and deepening relationship. Is that where we hit the wall? Does it shrivel up before persecution or the need for perseverance because it has no root? When we come to the edge of our love, where we have to choose between love and money or justice and power, is that where our love hits its limits, choked out before it can yield any harvest? When we inevitably come to the edge of our love, what do we do? Unpopular as this sentiment might be, I am grateful, grateful for the time that we live in. The groaning pains of the earth, the cries from the margins for liberation, they will not let us rest comfortably in our small hearted love. We are stretching. Friends, we are stretching the borders of our love in new and uncomfortable ways in God's modern day seed sowers that throw the seeds to us. The Me Too, the Black Lives Matter, Idle No More, Fridays for Future, they are stretching us. They are expanding the borders of our love. And we are the soil in which God places the hope for the people. Have we tilled, removed the stones, pushed back the thorns that live within our own hearts? Are we ready for God and for the miracle of abundance? It's only a matter of time before the seeds produce fruit. Amen. <laughs>